Medicare Cafe. As always, you're joined by your, joined by your hosts, Olivia. And I'm Mike, and today we're talking about email newsletters for the fact that we've been talking about email newsletters forever, but we've never really broken down and said, here's how you do it. So I went ahead and put my professor sweater on, and we're going to talk about email newsletters. My professional sweater. I want to have a professional tiara. When we start talking about really important things, I wear the tiara. You can have a sweater. That's fine. <laughs> that but is going to happen, just so you know. I'm, it's getting written down, which means it will get done. But this is something we're really excited to bring to you guys as well, because newsletters, like Mike and I talk about, newsletters accomplish so many different things. Newsletters are super important when it comes to your uh, retention program, especially if you do a quarterly newsletter. Uh, newsletters are really important for your networking and your opportunities to stay in front of your networking partner. They're very important for referrals. They're very important to stay in front of and top of mind of your clients. So an email newsletter will accomplish a lot of things, but you have to make sure you're making the absolute most of your time. Newsletters, if you allow it to, could really be a time suck for a lot of your marketing efforts. Yeah, I also read a study, because I read lots of studies, right, wrong, or different. But uh, one was talking about sales in general and that a lot of people that buy from companies, insurance included, are only aware of about 20% of the products or services offered. So newsletter is also a great way to cross-sell very subtly, you know, don't forget about dental insurance, don't forget about cancer insurance, don't forget about this, without being in their face, very salesy about it. So it's a great way to ex expand your current product offering to your pros prospects and clients in a very non-pushy way. Mm. Yes, so if you don't have one, this should be a priority right now, is to get a newsletter or think, I need to start one today, because like Olivia said, not from being forgotten. Uh, the two goals of a newsletter is one, to stay top of mind, not being forgotten. But the second thing I think I see a lot of newsletters make a mistake of is the newsletters for the person to take action in a newsletter, not to read the newsletter, but to click through it. And that's what mm -hmm. you want to focus on. You don't want to get them in a newsletter and have them sit there, look around a little bit, kick the tires and leave. You want them to look at it and go, okay, I want more information on this or that, or I want to click this over here. So keep in mind, I'm keeping top of mind, and what do I want them to do with this newsletter is some sort of action step. And I think that's a huge difference because you and I talk a lot about the two different types of delivery of newsletters, which is an email newsletter, and then, of course, mailing out, physically mailing them a newsletter. Both are effective, but they have different goals and they have different things that they a mail one is, you know, when you get, send somebody something in the mail, they're much more likely to open it. I mean, just in all honesty, email newsletters, you know, they're the, the rate of open isn't super high. So a paper newsletter that you're sending, they're more likely to get emails, but there's little to no call to action because you have to actively get that person to either go to their computer or pick up the phone in order to have a good call to action on a newsletter. An email newsletter, yes, the return on investment, um, you're not gonna get as many opens as you will with a paper one. However, those that do open it and click through it, you can get, you can have, like Mike mentioned, you can have a lot more actionable items in an email newsletter, like clicking a link or clicking a phone number to call. So it can, you can get a lot more out of it. Mike, what would you say your recommendation would be in order to get more opens on an email newsletter? One, consistency. Uh, because if you see it once, it's like, okay, that was just in passing. But the more frequency you have, the more the more repetition builds trust. Trust equals mm -hmm. click-throughs, and click-throughs equal appointments, and appointments equals sales. There's a long thread there. But yeah, I was, that was too long. I was, I was staying with you, though. You had it. Yeah, but yeah, basically frequency and make it interesting. Don't make it all about sales, 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 sales. And the click through, maybe it's to a third party news story, which we'll look at here in a minute on how to do that. <clears throat> but you wanna make sure that just get them involved because when they click through, that means they took some sort of action. They believe something in that newsletter. And the nice thing about electronic newsletters versus snail mail is that you can follow the analytics. You know, when mm -hmm. you send out a bulk mailing, you don't know what happens. Do they throw it out? Do they open it? There's no clue. When mm -hmm. you send out a newsletter electronically using one of the two platforms we're getting ready to talk about, you could see who opens it, what the click-through rate is, and what bad email addresses you have, as opposed to mm -hmm. your return to sender stuff. So a lot more analytics, and you can do a lot more to increase your um, 
your click throughs and your opens by okay this newsletter did really well i'm going to continue on that one as opposed to this one did really bad here's how i can make it better so a lot more usable information to increase couple your things down the road. couple things i'll mention here as well susan brought up a great point senior marketing specialist does have amazing if you are going to take the mailing route again both have pros and cons between mailing and emailing i like both um but susan says she may She's been mailing out the senior marketing specialist offer newsletter that through our AMP program, perfect, easy, done. I love it. Continue to do that. Um, my recommendation, and Brian kind of hinted at it, not in the way that I'm going to read the comment because I don't want to read the comment, but uh, they didn't. Brian did mention something, a great way to make sure that your, your newsletter gets opened and somebody actually opens that email. Look, pay attention. Stop it. Stop it. No, I no. Pay attention to the subject line of that email. If you put in the subject line newsletter, it's not going to get opened. And it's actually probably going to get marked as spam through platforms like Google, um, Microsoft, things like that. Whenever you put something like that newsletter, it comes across as advertising, comes across as sales. Mike, always, I think you came up with this idea that put a really exciting point about your newsletter in the subject line. And so be things like, a uh, soon and all recipe for diabetics. If that's a portion of your newsletter, put that in the subject line, it's much more likely to get open that way. One of my favorite stories about the senior marketing specialist newsletter, it goes out every Monday, was one time we put uh, a CMS violation as a subject line. <clears throat> and that got a lot of opens because everyone's like, what? And we did get a complaint about it. But you know what? One complaint out of the 4,000 people went to was an acceptable rate in my opinion. But yeah, that's prompted action. Another trick is use unique numbers. So like instead of saying 100,000 seniors like this, it's 98,742 seniors like this. More exact numbers create more interest because everyone rounds up. Everyone uses whole numbers. When you use a very precise number, it generates more attention because it makes it more believable. So let's go ahead and talk about the platforms. We'll talk about like the structure of it, but again, to get them to be open about it, you have to have a more of an outstanding subject line. Don't put newsletter in the subject line. We recommend two platforms. We recommend these two platforms because we, we Mike, Mike, Mike and myself, as well as senior marketing specialists, use both of these platforms. Again, each come with pros and cons about which platform is best for your wallet, for your budget, and, and what it, which one accomplishes your goals better. Yeah, there are other, obviously, options out there, but like Olivia said, these are two that we have used so we could speak on. I know people that are sales gurus and other newsletters have subscribed to use different platforms. If you want to explore, that's great. But MailChimp and Constant Contact are the two. We've used Constant Contact for the past eight years for our primary newsletter. Whenever we have webinar announcements, it goes out in Constant Contact. Um, MailChimp is, I think, in my opinion, more scaled down but and then, let me switch slides here real quick um, because we do a quick pros and cons list where mm -hmm. MailChimp's very easy to use and they have a free account option. So if you're like, I don't know if I'm going to fully commit to this before you buy a platform, you could go to MailChimp and they have a free option as long as you have less than 2000 email addresses or send less than 12,000 emails a month, which I think we're all in that ballpark. Uh, you could have a free account and use it until you reach those thresholds. Now, the con on the MailChimp is interface is so-so. I don't like the interface as much as I do constant contact. And there are limits in the free account. So you can't do all, you don't have all the bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. Now, constant contact, I think is much easier to use. I think it's a cleaner interface and I think it has better templates. But there's no free option. One huge thing, which we'll look at here in a minute, is if you want to link a news story from a third-party source, Constant Contact has a much more fluid system to do that than MailChimp. And that's what caused me to pull away from MailChimp and just bite the bullet and use Constant Contact for my own stuff. And I think it cost me $300 a year. So in sales perspective, if you make one or two additional sales a year off your newsletter, you've just paid for it and everything else is gravy. Exactly. Now, um, Bernadette asks a great question. She said, there's a weekly newsletter. Yeah, Senior Marketing Specialist does offer a weekly newsletter, has industry updates, updates what, um, what we have going on, trainings and educations we have. We have a tool section on there to make sure you recognize all the tools and resources. I'll show you guys 
at the end of today's presentation, I'll show you guys how to sign up for it. Yeah, like I said, they, they both provide analytics. I know in Constant Contact, we could go into our newsletter, any newsletter we send, and see who opened it. We could see mm -hmm. bounce email addresses, meaning bad email addresses. So you can take those off your list. We can mm -hmm. see who I don't think you see who clicked through, but you can see click through rates. Give you an idea. Our industry average in the insurance industry is about a, I think about an 18% open rate with about a two to five percent click through rate. So if you send every hundred people you send it to, you can expect about 20 people to open it and about five people to click through. I have nothing to add. Great job. Oh, okay. Uh yeah, but here's I wanted to show you, I made this in Constant Contact. So I went in and I made a, a kind of a sample newsletter in Constant Contact. So the very top, you can have your insurance logo or just type your name out or whatever it is. So there's your top, there's your branding. Then we do a main message, whatever your message is for that month, uh, a clear call to action being a button, uh, like send us an email or whatever you want to say. I did an interesting story, which I just randomly grabbed a story about Medicare and threw it in there. The nice thing about this is it does everything for you. You literally copy the link, paste it into Constant Contact, and it formulates it for you. So it puts a picture in there, it puts a little uh, subject line, a quick snippet, and then the link is automatically done. So you just copy, paste, and it does it all for you. Sometimes you get a goofy image, depending on where they're pulling the image from in the story. But like in this case, there it is. You know, how do you want to med? How do you want a Medicare supplement appeal? Options and costs. That's an interesting story. Uh, you could, you know, make it. I think that'd be good to share. Uh, next, you could do a product offering. You know, Medicare has no dental coverage. Talk about that real quick. I would recommend putting a button there as well to say, click here for details or contact us for more information. And then at the very bottom, contact us, and that's it. This is a very, very basic newsletter, but I think a lot of newsletters out there are just far worse than this. Uh, my I mentioned before the gentleman I bought my car from has a newsletter. He literally just types it out in email, and there's like no paragraphs. It's a just one big paragraph about some random thing. There's no call to action. It's one of the worst newsletters I've seen. I like the guy; he's a great guy. But I'm like, I just want to shake him, and be like, don't send that out because it's boring. Mm -hmm. Bernadette asked a great question about how often should do we send out the newsletters because she doesn't want to overset her oversaturate her people. Keep in mind, senior marketing specialist is a business to business, uh, con you know, conversation. So we do a weekly newsletter because we know that we have to stay top of mind in comparison to people who are also sending you weekly e emails from other FMOs because you would more likely be a business to consumer one. You know, if, what my recommendation would be to do either a monthly one, if you're going to do an email one, have an email one be monthly. And if you're going to do a quarterly one, I would recommend, uh, again, one monthly or quarterly. Senior marketing specialists, if, again, if you're going to be printing it out and mailing it, senior marketing specialists provides a seasonal one. So right now, the winter edition is out. Coming um, March and April, we'll come out with the spring edition one that, again, it's customizable. You can put your name, logo, headshot, everything, your contact information on that. But that is one that is actually mailed out to beneficiaries or mailed out to your consumers. These, again, because this one is internet-based and you're kind of playing the odds, it's a number game. If you're going to do an internet one or an email one, I would do it much more frequently. So I would say monthly. A second, Pat. One of the biggest questions we get is, I only have 15 email addresses. Should I do an email newsletter? And the answer is yes, because mm -hmm. I don't know how many people this goes to. When you send out through Constant Contact or MailChimp, it doesn't say this email went out to 10 people. I just get an email newsletter and it could have went to 10,000 people. It could have went to just me. I don't know. So you don't have to worry mm -hmm. about people thinking, well, that's why I went out to three people. It's going to take time to build that list, start collecting those email addresses. But the important thing is to start now. Another great mm -hmm. thing you could do is when, um, when you start getting those email addresses, you can add them one by one, or you just have an ongoing spreadsheet, and you can take the spreadsheet and import it into both systems to where it's just a mass import. You have to type out each individual email. So if you have a CRM, you could export your contacts, just take the email column and use that to import into your uh, new constant contact or MailChimp account, and that way you can do a bulk load, and it takes literally five minutes to do that. So you could populate easily and effectively. 
There are two trends of thoughts when it comes to how do you add somebody to your newsletter, and we personally have done both of them. There is the um, do I do first, ask for permission later, just assume you know they're talking to me so they want my contact, add them to my newsletter without asking permission. Again, not a concern with that. It's kind of the assumed sale, not saying anything negative against that, but keep in mind these platforms, including Constant Contact and MailChimp, both of them will have rules that if a certain amount of people mark your email as spam or, or you know, oh, that's just, if they mark it as spam, then you actually get kicked off from that platform. People mm -hmm. could also like unsubscribe. So I like the idea better of actually asking them if you if you if they would like to be a part of your newsletter or receive your newsletter on a monthly basis and say you know you're selling it it has really great content on there has like recipes information about Medicare so and and typically they'll say yeah that sounds great so keep them in on it as well one is not better than the other of course they do have pros and cons to both. Michael asked a great question he was saying do our newsletters need to be pre-approved by SMS? No, I will say um, we, you know, we do not have to approve your newsletters. We are happy to do so. We have an on-staff compliance officer, uh, Chaylin Jackson, who sits on the accounts team, act as routine training, to make, keep up to date with compliance by both CMS and the, our carriers as well. So we're happy to look it over for compliance reasons. However, we are not required to do so. If on your newsletter you're including any logos from carriers like United Healthcare, Aetna, Mutual of Omaha, one. Don't do that. Two, if you do include any of their logos or content on any of your marketing pieces, those do have to be approved by the appropriate carriers. So just don't even worry about it. Um, but again, don't worry about it. I wouldn't include those anyways. We don't have to approve anything prior to you submitting it. We will look it over for compliance reasons. And then Brian said, no, there are no other FMOs and senior marketing specialists. Absolutely, Brian. Absolutely. <laughs> Dang. Straight. Yeah. Again, like to reiterate and kind of reinforce Olivia, uh, this is your own business. You know, we the only time that I would want an FMO or some hierarchy to look at my newsletter if I had something questionable in there that I wasn't sure. This shouldn't be ever that thing. One, third party stories, that's not your material. So you don't have to worry about compliance because you're not the source of the article. Uh, and then the main message, you could, you know, like in here, I know it's hard to read. But it was just basically talking about, yes, we're still open. We have Zoom meetings. We have in-person meetings. And you could say, hey, for 2021, we want to make sure you're comfortable, you know, but still have the appropriate care or whatever for your, your message or for your health insurance, excuse me. So just have an interesting newsletter. You could celebrate birthdays for your staff. You do lots of things in there. This is the, this is the human side of your insurance agency is your newsletter. Um, but I would definitely, definitely have one. There's really no excuse at this point not to have a newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and Michael said he thinks of Chalen. He's always there to, when I call and need help. Chalen is a nerd. Just let me say that because he likes reading that and stuff. I enjoy reading it. I just wanted to do any reports on it. And Chalen's doing that. So God bless Chalen for doing the compliance. Uh, the biggest thing about compliance, uh, I'm gonna break it down to two things real quick. There's intent and interpretation. Intent being, what did you mean to do with this newsletter? The second one is interpretation because when you work with so many carriers, we get very polar opposite answers on the same compliance issue. So it really is, what's your intent with this? And this is sending out to clients, should be pretty, pretty easy. Uh, Van Shalen, love it. Yes, I will never call him anything else from here on out. So that's a sample layout. I literally took a blank layout and just built it. I know it's always overwhelming to start a new system or do a new program, but Constant Contact, I will speak on their behalf, is a very, very simple system. And the trick is, once you get a nice layout, you just copy that current layout and change the innards. So you change the main message, change the story, change your product offering, and then the rest of the layout is all the same. So once you build one you really like, it's not a matter of building it every single time, it's just a matter of changing the main points and then sending it back off again. So it really is a quick quick and easy way to see in front of your clients and prospects. All right, set up a free account. They both have free trials. So you can go in there. MailChimp will be free for life if you stay under the parameters. Uh, Constant Contact has a free setup. And a little trick, when you get them on the phone, um, talk them down a little bit. I was able to save a couple bucks, but I'm like, ah, oh, it's kind of expensive. And they're like, what if it was this price? So I was like, well, what about this price? 
that'll do. So kind of like talking to your cable companies, threaten to leave and they magically have lower rates. Um, not to say they shouldn't, they don't earn that money, but you know, we gotta make money too. Uh, load your email addresses. If you have a CRM, just download your contact list. And if you need help with that, let us know. And then what I do is I literally delete all the columns except for the email column and then import it into their system, build your first newsletter, and then just fire it out. And make sure, again, you're consistent with it. So think the first of every quarter, so January 1st, April 1st, was it July and September, are that's when I need to send out my quarterly newsletter. Or if you're doing it monthly, just think on the fifth of every month, I send out my newsletter. And you can build it throughout the month and then just you can schedule it in the future. So if you build it, you know, 10 days early, you can say, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to schedule it out five days from now or 10 days from now, whatever it is, and you're good to go. And if you need a course, if you need content, SMS Agent Connect on Facebook, there's a ton of stuff on there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's all I got. All right. And don't forget, speaking of CSG actuarial, we happen to have a quote engine. What? Mm -hmm. And this thing is slicker than snot. So check it out. I love the fact that you can do underwriting because that's one of the biggest things about doing a med sub is underwriting because what's acceptable with one carrier is a denial in another. And it's very hard to come back from a denied application because a lot of trust and confidence will be will be eroded by your client by going, I don't wanna go through all that again, I'll just stick with what I got. I've made that mistake numerous times in my career, don't recommend it, so Quote Engine has built-in underwriting, definitely check it out. Brian, that's a great question. He's asking about Medicare Center. Medicare Center is our integrity platform that is used that will be in, uh, replacing Enrollment Express. That change is happening the 28th. You will be getting an email about it if you are a Enrollment Express user. Um, all, none of your Enrollment Express content is lost. It all just gets uploaded through the Medicare Center platform. The only difference is that you'll access a new link to access ever access it, and you'll use your NPN as your login. Only changes that will be happening. So keep your eyes and nose and ears. Keep all things census to the ground. More content to come about that, but we're really excited. It will include, it's basically the Medicare Center is you're taking CSG and the MedSup and ancillary product quoting, mashing it up with a, with um, Enrollment Express, which is the quoting and enrollment for Medicare Advantage and Part B, adding a CRM, a separate CRM to that as well, and meshing it all together so it's under one platform. Um, and of course, if you have any other carriers or contracts with any other integrity partner, then it all is housed under one place. So you have United Healthcare Senior Marketing Specialist, but Aetna with a company like Tidewater doesn't hey, matter. One login gets you access to all of those carriers. So we'll make your lives easier. Yes. Uh, can you quote more than one pharmacy? Um, for Brian? Absolutely. I hadn't seen it yet. Supposedly on the new platform, you can. Yes. So there you go, Brian. Uh, and I'm glad you were able to move the chat box over Olivia's face. <laughs> I think that's hysterical. It is, it is what it is. And Susan says, we've been hearing about this from other FMOs. So glad we're making that transition. Us too. I'm so excited to go from the Enrollment Express platform to the Medicare Center platform. Um, we, I think uh, we actually locked out during AEP. This was first AEP with Medicare Center. I don't think there were a ton of issues. However, we got to get the bugs worked out on other organizations. So we ended up, so we kind of get to come in after all that's been worked out. Very, very, very excited, but um, excited for the transition. I hear amazing things about Medicare Center. I'm really excited to be able to use the platform myself. 100%. And the last, last objection we get a lot is not all my clients have email. Well, my, my uh, reply to that or my rebuttal, that's the R word I'm looking for, rebuttal, is why would you deny the clients that have an email address for the ones that don't? So send it out. You know what? It's going to take time to build. You know, my one of my favorite quotes is Twitter talking about how hard work, perseverance, and 11 years of trying makes you look like an overnight success. It took Twitter 11 years to get off the ground and become super popular, it's gonna take a handful of newsletters to gain momentum, but you know what? Again, if it generates a couple sales or retains a handful of clients, it's worth its weight in gold because if, I promise you that other agencies 
your carriers and a bunch of other people are having newsletters and email communications with your clients. And <clears throat> we always joke, a little insider secret here, you know, we have a MedSup conference that we recommend for carriers, FMOs, not really for agents. You can go, but it's really generate for the, the agent, big agencies and FMOs. And the joke is if you don't go, you're forgotten because and then mm -hmm. everyone's wondering why aren't you there? If, if mm -hmm. you don't come to the party, people will miss you for a minute and then they'll forget. And the same thing happens in your client's inbox and their social media feeds. They'll miss mm -hmm. you for a minute and then you're just forgotten about and you're replaced by something bigger, brighter and relevant. So make sure you're not part of that forget forgetting section. Make sure you're staying relevant. Mm -hmm. oh, see my hand. All right, so I got to read here. because I'm. Sadie mentioned, and what better reason to get an email than to communicate about their literal health care? Perhaps encourage them to get an email. And again, it's all about making sure that you're marketing for the clients that you want, not for the clients that you have, especially if you're experiencing a book of business that's getting older. If your median age of your book of business is 75, you know, creeping up to their late 70s, then, I mean, I hate to sound nasty about it, but you don't want your commissions to literally die off so making sure that you are making the absolute most out of your book of business and marketing and trying to get those baby boomers who are turning 65. yeah i fun fact last night i talked to my parents how to hook up their laptop to the television so they could watch discovery plus because their smart tv doesn't have the app yet so and both my parents are on medicare so they're getting savvy and they're getting they're getting there and mind you it took way too long to explain how to do it but they did it so they are you know if you think wow my all my 65 year old people are just too ancient for this stuff they're not they all have mm -hmm. iphones or androids and they probably all have tablets they all have laptops that's how they're communicating especially now when they're more on lockdown or if they live in a major city they're online communicating with friends and family and you make sure that your newsletter and you are there with them. Um, so Mike was asking, and this is something we definitely need to talk about. We are already 30 minutes into the Medicare cafe guys. So we are going to have to wrap this up. Michael was asking about, um, well, Michael, we'll get to your question here at the end. Mike, go ahead and talk about Friday live. Hey, yeah, real quick Friday live. We're changing it up a little bit because we realize it's a little harder to find Facebook live in a group than it is on a page per Facebook because we're subject to Facebook's, you know, platform. So we are moving the Maycare Cafe Friday Live to the Maycare Cafe page. And if you go there, you can see there's a little advertisement talking about Q and appointment tips, and there's instructions how to get notified when we go live. So look for that post, like it, comment. If you have trouble, let us know, but it's a very simple process. You just simply go through notifications. And again, it's like four steps. It takes less than a minute. And when we go live, you'll get a little, no a little notification on Facebook saying Medicare Cafe is live. You click it and you'll see us go live. Mm -hmm. So there we go. Now we can talk to Michael. All right, guys. So again, if you do have any more 